Welcome, Jonathan, to the show. I'm honored to have you on the show. I mean, you got this incredible background in, in LinkedIn. What's on your mind today? Where Where do you want to go with this conversation? Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And you know what? I think a little bit of background just to put things into perspective might help. You did mention I, I spent some time at LinkedIn. It was almost 10 years, actually. And my first five and a quarter years was building a social media recruitment strategy for LinkedIn's largest global customers. So basically the largest global companies. And then the last four and change years, it switched. We developed a, an employee advocacy platform. And so I was building uh, advocacy sort of strategy and deploying those kinds of programs for our largest customers. They had a variety of different use cases. One of them was talent acquisition. Another one was social selling, marketing. And then the last was uh, corporate uh, reputation and, uh, and brand reputation. So that's where I spent my time. And then now more recently, I consult with Social HP, which is purely on the employee advocacy and social selling front. So, you know, happy to start there and, and work our way forward. So help me as someone who's not familiar, like a commoner, okay, Employee advocacy. I understand what the words mean, but what is that when you say it? So I guess in a nutshell, you've got a bunch of employees and you want them saying good things about the company. And in, in, in an ideal scenario, you're also raising their professional profile to make them more approachable for your customers. And so employee advocacy is really delivering thought leadership, industry news, and company content that they can share out to their social networks. What's in it for them is you're raising their professional profile. You're making it easier for them to be able to sell. And then what's in it for the company, of course, is, is expanding or landing new relationships for business. Typically, those are the, uh, the things we focus on. So, so I don't know whether you want to talk about it at your, your current company, which, and, and, and the name of that company again is, is what? This, it, social, yeah, it's Social HP, which that's HP what I stands thought. for. I just didn't want to say power. it wrong. Okay, Social yeah, no Horsepower, works. Social HP. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, because I tripped over the HP, I always think Hewlett Packard. So, uh, <laughs> social right. Horsepower. But so, I'm really curious on the advocacy piece. Mm -hmm. So you're you're helping these people get out. So if you're, is that basically you're teaching people how to do it strictly on LinkedIn, or is it on other platforms or their own type of website or whatever. So, yeah. So it's on LinkedIn. It's on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Okay. And then just to, just to kind of, I'll, I'll give you some LinkedIn examples because that's my experience, but it's really applicable to all of these platforms. But just very quickly, let's take an example of a small company with 50 employees. Those companies, typically they average about uh, 800 to 1,000 followers, which means if you do an update for your company on LinkedIn, 800 to 1,000 people might see that. The average person on LinkedIn, the average member has 800 connections. So if you get one of your employees to share out that story, you reach about the same number of people. But if you get all 50 of your employees to share out that story, you reach around 40,000 people. So instantaneously, the power of the message of your company goes from 1,000 to 40,000. And you can do paid campaigns. Those platforms love to do paid campaigns for you. And they, they're, not, they're not inexpensive. <laughs> yeah, they're very yeah. good. They're, they're accurate. And, they're, and, and so all of these platforms are very good with paid. And you can say, like, I want to target these people in this location at this level in this industry. And they'll run that campaign. And those ads will go in front of them. The challenge with those is that they're expensive and they're finite. And so finite meaning, like, you start your campaign and very quickly it's over and Hopefully people clicked and they're going to buy some of your product and then you move forward. With advocacy, it's an entire year of conversation that you can have with the, the community and the audience. And who are your employees connected to? Well, they're connected to your current customers and they're connected to your future customers, your prospects. So if you can have a lot of touch points with them, you don't have to put ads in front of them the whole year. You can just make your employees look good. You can make them look more professional with thought leadership and industry news. And then periodically you smatter in a little bit about the company products and services. Over the course of a year, you've changed that perspective of your entire employee's network about who your company is and what they're about. So that's really the sort of the, the nuts behind advocacy and why you want to do that. And then that also sort of heads into and dips into the topic around social selling, which is why would a salesperson want to share content? Why would they want to connect with people on platforms like LinkedIn? Why would they want to message people and so on? And statistically uh, at LinkedIn, 70% of salespeople that engaged in social selling behaviors were, oh, sorry, 
salespeople that engage in social selling behaviors were 70% more likely to hit their sales quota. So it's powerful. It does work. So let me do a disclaimer up front in yeah, in please that, do. In that, I think one of the things that that, and then I'm going to be a little bit of a skeptic because because I'm going to be your classic person who has not used social media effectively. Okay, okay. so I'm not going to claim I'm a know it all. I'm going to say I'm a not know it all. But first of all, I, I recommend to the audience really to consider what this discussion is going to be about. But also a little warning: if you're going to do employee advocacy you better have a really strong company culture. So last week's podcast is with someone who does recruiting. And so she calls and she says, you know, sometimes she's connecting with someone and says, are you happy? You know, do you feel valued or whatever her two questions are? And sometimes they'll say, I'm totally happy. There's nothing you could do. You know, I love my company. I'm not going anywhere. Right. Okay? And interestingly enough, she said, rarely, does someone want to leave because of money? Sure. These, these days, usually companies are competitive on the comp side. Okay. So if you're going to do employee advocacy and make them more visible, they're going to get hit more by recruiters. Wouldn't you agree, Jonathan? Possibly. Except, Possibly. Okay. Except it's they get hit by the people in their network. Okay. So if they're connected to a pile of recruiters, absolutely, they're going to get hit more, <laughs> hit more by recruiters. But if I'm sharing out content, it goes out to the people that are in my network. Okay. So if I'm connected to people that did the same thing as me, like if I'm a sales rep and I'm sharing content, then other sales reps are going to see it because we work together at other companies. But mostly it's going to be my clients and my, and my prospects. So when are, I'm that, sharing that this information, audience. it's not going out, you know, public feeds. It's going out to those people that are in my, in my network that I'm connected to. So I think I got like close to 4,000 or something like that. It's going to go out to those 4,000, but it's not going to go beyond that. Okay. Exactly. Well, unless, so if someone in your 4,000 likes or comments, then it also goes to their network. Okay. Which is good in, in some ways. Yeah. Cause then you're amplifying your message, especially if it's someone that matters to you. So, yeah. you know, the, the goal isn't to convince 760 million LinkedIn members that your company is, <laughs> is the best and that they all need to buy your stuff. Yeah, the goal yeah. is to convince everyone you want to sell to that your company is the right company <laughs> and that you guys are the best. Okay. And that's the same thing for recruiting. If you want to recruit talent, have the employees that have the right skills share the content that is related to the kinds of roles that you want to recruit for. So yeah. if you need to hire tech people, have your tech people share out thought leadership, share out your employee value proposition, share out the great projects that you're working on, because then the people in their networks will want to work at your company. Okay. It'll also remind your employees that you guys are doing cool shit and that they should probably want to stay there. Yeah, now, yeah. If you have a terrible, if you have a terrible culture, this may backfire terribly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but most companies, you know, they can represent themselves reasonably well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's a whole nother conversation. But I just want to have that disclaimer up front. Now, let's talk about the inept guy who's uh, on LinkedIn. Me personally, we'll use me as the example. Okay, well, I'll be the target. So I have no time. Yep. Most of the communications, as a matter of fact, quite frankly. I would say 100% of the communications I get on LinkedIn right now from somebody when they contact me yep. are because they want to sell me something. Correct. They, they don't That's really want to make a contact. It's all, it, it, they may try to sugarcoat it, you know, oh, I just want to connect with people in your industry, whatever. Right, yeah, right, right. You know, forget yeah, it. I get those invitations every day. Yeah, it's, come on. So, so help me understand, because I literally do not comprehend. Right. So, so I'm actually very sincere, all right? I don't, I don't get it. So I have no time. I have no time to look at something that people in my network are posting. Yep. And so, and when I'm posting, I mean, most of the time I'll post something when we do these podcasts, but I'm just post and go, right? Right. So what am I missing? Where's the value for me that, that I can deliver to somebody else? I'm happy to, to put in the time if I truly can do something that's going to help somebody else. Yep. And I'm happy to read a little bit more about what my network's putting forth if I feel there's some value there. Correct. So w w talk to me about that. What, where am I missing the boat? Because well, obviously so, it sounds like a lot of people are being successful. Yes, but let's also put it into perspective. 760 million LinkedIn members are not doing exactly this. Right. So this is a, a small percentage of people are sharing content and, and, and engaging and interacting in this kind of a way. 
you're absolutely right. Most of the in-mail messages that I get are, hey, you know, I'm connecting and I know absolutely why they're wanting to connect, right? They want to sell me something. But these are not in-mails. This is sharing thought leadership, industry news, and company content. So now let's put this into perspective. You're like most members and you're unlike some. You're like most members, which is, I don't have time. Like, why would I make this my new full-time job, <laughs> picking content, becoming a social media marketing expert and a copywriter? Like, I'm none of those things, nor do I want to become an expert in those things. Yeah. So that is, the, that is the number one challenge with advocacy programs is usage. So if you get a thousand employees to raise their hand and, and say, yeah, yeah, this is great. And they all sign up. You have a thousand people on statistically on average 200, you can convince to get in there on a monthly basis. The other 800 are like, yeah, that yeah, sounds totally great anyway. And then they get back to work and they're doing their job and they're moving along and, and they're either intimidated because they don't know what to pick. They don't know what to write, or they're just too darn busy. And you could even email them and say, can you please share this? And they say, sure, sure, sure. 10 minutes later, they're on the call and they're like, what was that thing? I don't even, and then they're onto the stuff that they're, they're trying to do their jobs, right? They're trying to get their jobs. Yeah, done. Yeah. So that is the difference between every other social platform that is employee advocacy and social HP. Because social HP, we built a do it for me functionality, which means I can, one curator can disseminate the exact content that should be going out by audience with varied like copy and images and so on so that I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. And I could spend an hour and a half a month as an administrator and have all of our employees sharing out all the brightest and best stuff. And when you share out like a good story, even if it's not about the company, let's say it's just like, you know, Harvard Business Review article about, you know, the top five ways to improve your leadership skills. If it's a good article, that is valuable to your network and you will get people liking it or resharing it or saying, hey, thanks so much. And ideally you say, sort of say, you know, you know, you've got some sort of personal perspective, but even if you don't, it's still providing some value to the network. There is, there's little value to just sort of spray content constantly and filling up everybody's news feed because you'll definitely be seen a lot, but you won't be recognized as someone that's providing any value. So this is about being thoughtful with the content. The challenge is most employees, most people don't have the time or interest to actually be an expert or that thoughtful about the content. So a very sharp person, somebody that is good with content can do incredible things for the company if they get people to raise their hand and then they can, for the 20% of the people that want to go in and pick stories and share them, perfect. They can write their own copy, brilliant. For the rest of the people who don't want to do it, but actually want to raise their hand and say, yeah, if you can make me look better, smarter, faster, stronger, $6 million man like, then great. You know, put me in, sign, my, sign me up and away we go and they can take care of it for you. And then in aggregate, the company sees incredible benefits. So am I understanding it correctly? So it sounds like you're saying that Social HP, your company basically is that expert with the content. Does that mean you're choosing all the content? Or does that mean I'm feeding you the content and you're kind of tweaking it, whatever, or it's a hybrid between those two? So the platform itself is a content distribution channel and it pulls in all of the different thought leadership, company news, industry news, all that kind of stuff. It's all in the tool. And all you need is one person that's a marketing person or a social media person that has an understanding about content to spend an hour and a half a month in the tool and then that's all, you, like, that's the end of it. That's pretty much the story. The original platforms that came out required a lot more heavy lifting. Like yeah. they required multiple people curating and constant badgering of employees. Hey, can you please send that out? Can you please share this? Can you please share that? Can you please share this? Please, 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 please. And then of course, employees are like, this is a lot. Like, you know, like you're asking me to do a lot of lifting and I don't want to do any of it. So it's now been simplified. And so therefore, you know, I would say though, this isn't the perfect solution for everybody. If you're a company where you say, I would never want to share a story where an employee hasn't completely read it, vetted it, and written their personal perspective on it, then this is not the right tool for you. But I'd say those companies are few and far between because most companies are like, hang on a second, I have to pay how much money to reach people? And then if I get my employees to do it, it gets how much more? I think that's a good option. It's interesting. It strikes me. It, it seems like a piece of the puzzle is that if I could also create a company culture yep. where our people were, you know, 
20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes midday or something, or at the end of the day, whatever, whatever the schedule is, we kind of built in a habit. It's kind of like, oh, what is uh, IJM, International Justice Mission that fights trafficking, sex trafficking. You know, it's a Christian organization. They are one of the rare ones. They take, it's either a half an hour or an hour at 11 a.m. in the morning, and the whole company shuts down and they pray. Right. And in a similar mode, if you had something in your organization where you tested, you know, you pilot something, you pilot ideas, right? Lean startup type of model. And you said, okay, from, you know, 9 to 9.15 every morning, 8.45 to 9, whatever the time is, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, you're going to respond to the things that people post, you know, because we're posting, people reply and you're going to respond or you're going to read what other people have, have posted in your network and comment try to find some like things it. that you like and comment sure. or like it or whatever. And so you get used to it. It's very intriguing for me, particularly then if you had like a, a, a weekly discussion, maybe it was a half an hour yep. within your team. You know, the, the military likes to say, I think it's, it's four people or the ideal team size. Right. And you said, okay, well, once a week, at, you know, we're going to do this thing, 15 minutes a day, twice a day, 15 minutes, twice a day. And then once a week, half an hour, we're going to talk about what do we see? What do we learn? Whatever. Not just from what we're doing in the interactions, which is valuable, but also what do we see other people doing? Mm -hmm. And if you tried that for 30 or 90 days, and, you know, would that make any impact? Was that changing the way we were doing anything? Did we learn anything new about our clients? I'm very intrigued by it, but you have to understand, I'm, I'm kind of an idea junkie. Too. Sure. Well, so I, I think yeah. I think conceptually it'd be great, you know, building those kinds of habits. I haven't seen any companies do it, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It's a leadership decision, right? How how people, how we would like our employees to spend their time. So, you know, I, I think, you know, as, as long as there's a leader that says, hey, this is a great idea and this is how we're going to do it, and employees are, you know, sort of willing to embrace it, then absolutely, I think it's a great idea. I think that, you know, in execution, it might be challenging, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. But I think if you hire the type of person that's going to be open to it and you have the company culture and it's built into the culture, for sure, see, then, yeah. then, you that, know, that's, that's something. Yeah. Then you build it over time because you're, you, you're, yeah. you're making that decision that, hey, as you come on board, this is how we're onboarding you. This is what we're looking for out of our employees. This is the kind of discussion, quality discussion we're looking to make online. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. Yeah, and it, it it also strikes me, um, and I have another question, but it also strikes me in that I, I don't read any mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just forgive me, I don't trust it. So, but but what I do is um, I read one site that I that I trust that kind of you know reports on things from us. Every media has a bias. Sure. Okay. I mean that's just a fact. Okay, so I read one where I I agree with their bias and I think they're. They're thoughtful and they're not attacking type people. Yep. And then I um, I get something called 21 Hats from this guy, Lauren Feldman, who used to be with Forbes and some other things. And what he does is he curates, mm -hmm. you know, so he goes out and scours and then he throws some stuff on there that's thoughts for primarily entrepreneurs, but any business person. And so I get some insights that way. I mean, I didn't even know that the 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 Chauvin, the George Floyd, you know, verdict had come out a day after the trial. Oh wow. Until until I think it was this morning. Okay. So what I'm a week late, right? Yep. And you know, so so that's where I but I live just fine, you know? Right. Well but I I'm, I typically also don't watch any of the mainstream media, but for whatever reason it seems those stories seem to make their way to me pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> well that was a big one. That was they a big one. Them. They find their way to me pretty quick, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was a big one, an important one, and, and one of the sad moments in America's history, I really think, that tragic all the way around. And um, But, you know, that's a whole other conversation that I'm not afraid to have. I, I love to have that even off with, on people who, with people who disagree, but um, with me. So another question I have for you. So let's say I've got this network. The number you're using is uh, four, 800 people. I've got contacts. Okay, you're saying on, on average or whatever. Yes. 800 people. So, and those are people that uh, I've got in my in my network. So what about adding to that? What are your recommendations? I mean, I mean, right, if I want to grow my company, right? Yep. I may want to get some other thought leaders or I may want to get just people who have similar thoughts or approaches to business or whatever. 
What's the best way to add to that? Is it by is it by joining some groups, or is it by just kind of one by one going out? I, I mean, what's your you get this vast experience on LinkedIn. I'm really curious. So the, that kind of best practice does vary. And like everyone sort of has their own opinion as to what's the best way to manage their network. So one leader that I worked with, his description of his willingness to add somebody into his network was, would I go for a coffee with them? Or could I, could I message them and say, hey, let's have a chat. Let's go for a coffee. I think now today it's probably, hey, would you have time for Zoom? <laughs> but, but until that, you know, everything completely opens up, you know, would, would I go for a coffee with them? And if the answer is yes, then there's probably value in me connecting. You know, so is there like, is there a reason for us to do business together? And if there isn't a reason for him to do business with them, then he says, Hey, you know what? Thanks for the invitation. At this point in time, I don't see us, you know, working on like on a, on a business project. So I really only just reserve my network for people that I'm currently doing projects with. And then that's how he closes it up. And his is therefore a fairly finite network. Other people are on the exact opposite side, which is they will connect with everybody. And I think it's called a lion, a LinkedIn lion, which is, um, somebody that I think they cap you at 30,000 connections and they just connect with as many people as they possibly can. And then of course, there's everyone in between me personally, I'm closer to connecting with people that like, if I could reach out to them, they're likely to respond and, and provide some help or, or if they, you know, reach out to me, I'm likely to respond and provide some help. And, um, so, so I, I say that's one note. Then there's some best practices around how to connect with people, you know, which is, Definitely, I think, you know, you don't want to approach them with, do you want to buy something? And then second, is there a compelling reason why you would want to connect with them otherwise? Because if they are a potential, you know, prospective client, you know, whether it's garnering feedback on, you know, their approach to the industry or what their thoughts are so far with competitive products, because you really want to understand, those could be valuable conversations where you aren't necessarily, you know, trying to sell them something. So there's, there's value in growing your network in that, in that perspective, but people who share content do get more information, uh, do get more invitations to connect because you do build out some visibility. And, you know, when people in your network reshare or like, or comment on something that you've shared, then that makes it visible to their network. And then they're, you know, they're thinking, oh, Hey, this person seems to be pretty knowledgeable on this, or they're a subject matter on that and a matter expert on that. And so they, they take time to sort of you know, appreciate what it is that you're, you're doing on the network. And so that does drive more connections, but there is value. It's definitely, there's value in connecting with people. So please talk to me a little bit about Instagram because I, I, you know, follow a few people on Instagram. I don't know the platform. Well, yeah. I love uh, Toby Max, a guy who puts out some very thoughtful phrases, you know, regularly, which I, I really enjoy They're they're thought provoking. And then some other people post some things and, and some people post some things I really don't, <laughs> not as interested in and uh, whatever, but, and some stuff is really cool. And some people too, too much self promote, but you mentioned that that's one of the platforms that social HP, you know, supports or encourages use of. So what are some of the best practices you found on Instagram? It's the, from a company's perspective, it's the same. It's you want to provide value. So, you know, don't just talk about yourself. We actually had a really good ratio when I was at LinkedIn, which was for every six pieces of content, it's three, two, one. So three pieces of thought leadership, two pieces of industry news, one piece about the company. So if you hold that ratio on any of those platforms, that's where the value comes from. Otherwise, you're just, you know, product, 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 service, 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 tooting your own horn. And, you know, then people just get tired of it pretty quick. So you want to be able to provide some value. I think the messaging might shift because it's a more finite, you know, it's a shorter uh, attention span and the amount of communication, like the amount of verbiage that you put in on uh, intro for an image or an article is smaller, kind of like, kind of like Twitter. But I will say personally, I, I, like my own personal use of, of Instagram is not that great. I follow, I think 17 people and, and that's it. And it's like, they're interesting. And then kind of nobody else is until somebody that I know goes, <laughs> should totally follow this person. And then I follow them. And then if I don't see value, I unfollow them as quickly as possible. Cause it just fills up. Cause you have like a little news feed. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. And then of course they all, anytime you've ever clicked on anything, it literally builds like a world around whatever you've clicked on. So they'll try and surface things to you that a lot of people click on. But if you don't click on any of that and you start clicking on like nature photos and, and other things, literally when you click on, you know, the for me kind of channel, all it will be will, will be nature photos and nature videos and travel. And because it's, it's, it's like they want, the algorithm wants to engage you. 
And yeah. so, uh, so a lot of people find these kinds of platforms like the vortex of doom where they kind of get sucked in and they're just blowing hours, you know, like scrolling through things, you know, that's where the, the newest, you know, a platform like TikTok kind of does the exact same thing where people just like literally invest hours and hours and, and others are doing it in YouTube and whatnot. LinkedIn, yeah. I would say from my perspective is the platform where your newsfeed ideally is filled with valuable content from your network about like, oh, I didn't know that, or, oh, that's interesting, or, oh, thank you, that's really, like, I appreciate that, rather than, oh, they're selling this, oh, they're selling that, oh, they're selling this. And so if, if, you're, if your network is filled with people that are providing that kind of value, that's good. If people are constantly disseminating information that isn't valuable, you can unfollow them. You don't have to disconnect, but you can unfollow them so that none of their stuff shows up in your newsfeed anymore. And you can, can pretty much do that for any of those networks. And then the people that are sharing valuable content, like you know, there was a couple of people you've already mentioned that you, you know, you're like, these people deliver, you know, good stuff. That's what you need to do on, on LinkedIn, you know, and whether you do it individually or as a company, you know, how you represent yourself really matters, how you represent yourself professionally and how you represent yourself as perhaps a thought leader or somebody that's, uh, you know, engaged in a particular area of expertise. So it seems like when you're, when you're social selling or social connecting, okay, so if we're not really selling, it, if I'm thinking, it seems like it's one of those things where, you know, you've got two seconds to grab the person. And I noticed some people like Toby Mack puts his statements and he's got somebody doing some really nice artwork. Sure. So so it looks attractive. It's a quick message. And that's all he's got. Right. You know, boom. And I see some other people on Instagram. And of course, you see this on LinkedIn and the other platforms. Sure. A lot of people are moving to video. Right. And I have mixed response to that. And then, I mean, what are you finding is is most effective on these platforms as far as if I'm going to choose? Am I going to put a pretty picture up there with a few words? Am I going to put, am I going to do video? Am I going to put some long text? Am I going to try to do, what's... The platforms themselves prioritize video. It typically drives twice the number of engagements. So okay. the algorithm will prioritize that. Now, if someone like Toby Mack, who's putting up a crafty image and, a, and, a, and like really compelling text, and, and that person's got a ton of followers, then the algorithm's going to prioritize that person too, because he's getting the engagements. Okay. But if you start out and you have the ability of putting a video or putting up a static image, the algorithm's going to go, video is going to work better because video does work better. That okay. doesn't mean yet that your video is good. It just means that, <laughs> that that's how the prior, that's how the, all the, you know, that's how the algorithm kind of looks at it is, is statistically what's most compelling. And then there are things like if, if a video starts to gain some, you know, a foothold, then it will get recognized and it'll start to be promoted throughout the network. Hence where you get people that, you know, all of a sudden their video went viral. It's because it was compelling to a few people and then that caught on a little bit. And then all of a sudden the algorithm went, I think everyone should see this and throws it in everyone's newsfeed. And then it gets, you know, millions of, of comments, likes, clicks, or, or views. So there's, you know, there's something to that. But uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert on what to write or, you know, what kind of video to shoot. I'm, I'm not that compelling personally. So, you know, for me online, I, I try to say as little as possible. And to be honest, I feel like my opinions aren't that valuable online. Like already people have my opinions, so I don't need to really, you know, tell people what they are. You know, everyone's already got them anyway. So it's not like I need to try and convince somebody one way or the other of something. So you've been doing this for 10 plus years. And now you're helping out social at HP. Yep. Do you have a couple stories of someone who really was not doing well online and did steps one, two, three, and then, you know, really gained some traction or really had some success type of thing? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it would be. Uh, well, OK, I guess I have a couple of examples. They're going to be for, for companies. They won't be individuals, but there are individuals at those companies. I can give you one example. Um, this one was from when I was at LinkedIn, where they wanted to promote the CEO and they wanted to drive more engagements, more likes, comments, and reshares off of the CEO's posts. And there's a, this is a great thing to be able to do with a platform like Social HP. We were using at the time, we were using LinkedIn Elevate. And so normally when you have like a CEO's message, they put it out, it goes out to their network. 
and whoever is following them. Now, if they're a LinkedIn influencer, there's only 500 of them, then giddy up, it's going to however many, you know, tens of thousands of people that, that are following them or perhaps millions. But if you're a CEO or an executive at an organization and you're not an influencer, which means odds are you're not, because there's unless you're one of 500, you're not. So then how do you build up your following? How do we raise your profile? Because companies with a CEO or executives that are more engaged socially, they do better in business because they're more approachable, they're humanized, et cetera, et cetera, rather than some icon sitting in an office where we don't know anything about them. Now, all of a sudden, we're getting like their take on things and, you know, a, an expression on a particular business topic or how they, you know, how they're, wherever the industry is going, they have opinions and their opinions t- typically are weighted. So what, you, what they would do is they would take that CEO's message and then they would share it out to like ask their employees to share that. And instead of getting a couple hundred engagements, they would get 15 to 20,000. Wow. So 15 to 20,000 likes, comments, or reshares. And that's enormous. So it's that kind of thing where to take, to take a message and amplify it through your employees' networks rather than just the existing channels that you already own. And then getting those, because your, your, you know, your executive is, is, is representing the brand entirely. Like, you know, your employees are, but the executive has, has a certain weight on them. And so when they provide a perspective on some sort of business issue, the employees really want to be able to celebrate that. They want to be able to say, this is what our executive thinks. And we, you know, we value that. Then that drives a lot of engagement. So that's a, a great example of amplification it done really well. Cool. Cool. Well, I, I'm really intrigued by social HP. So is people just, if they want to learn more about what you're doing and what your company's doing, do they just go to socialhp.com? Yeah, they can either go to socialhp.com or they can message me on LinkedIn. It's Jonathan Baldock. I'm pretty easy to find. Otherwise, they can email me. So it's just jonathan at socialhp.com and I'm happy to help. Fabulous. Hey, thanks so much for spending time with us today, Jonathan. I, I'm really just getting started. But we, we have to end this podcast due to our limitations. But uh, sure. yeah, I wish this was a dinner party and we were meeting and we could talk for another two hours. Yeah, I'm sure we'd have a lot to talk about. Yeah, I really appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>